Yeah. Uh, so uh, before the next uh, lecture from uh, sir is starting, I want to ask sir: Is in this guidelines do we have any uh, timing like uh, like all the high anti-hypertensive medication should be taken? Because there was one um, uh, paper in cardiology journal regarding taking the anti-hypertensives during the bedtime usually decreases cardiovascular mortality. So is there anything any guideline on like when to take these medications as such in two thousand twenty two? Sundir, let me just say that the ADA clinical practice guidelines have been put to get bed for 2022. There is nothing about this. And by the way, do not delude yourself. There is zero data supporting nighttime dosing. That one paper that you talked about has been retracted from the New England Journal. The, there have been three other well-done studies randomizing dosing nighttime versus daytime. We did one of those studies a few years ago. There is zero data supporting nighttime dosing for better blood pressure control, period. Interestingly, and this remains to be seen, there is a paper coming out from a study that we did, an ABPM study, with finerenone. And finerenone seems to improve <clears throat> and this is not nighttime dosing, this is morning dosing, seems to improve nighttime blood pressure. And this needs to be further studied, but it, it's quite interesting. Daytime blood pressure doesn't do anything. Nighttime blood pressure seems to reduce it. So we don't know why. It's an observation. We'll see. But nothing for glucose. Forget it. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Bakris, can we change non-dippers to dippers uh, by any way? I mean, patients who have you know, non-dippers... And we know the, that the they answer, have a higher mortality. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. The short answer is uh, to a certain extent. Um, if they have sleep apnea and you improve sleep apnea, yes, that seems to help a little bit. Possibly finerenone. We don't know. Um, nothing else seems to really help. Weight loss, dramatic weight loss. I'm talking about people that have had surgery, 70 pounds, 90 pounds. There's some small studies, very small, that suggest maybe improvement there. But the true mechanism for why this is happening in the first place is unclear. People were postulating hypoxia. Probably not. Is it inflammation? Maybe, but inflammation, you can blame for everything. So we don't understand it. We don't know. Just like I can give you 15 mechanisms by how SGLT2s work. And they're not all in the kidney. So it's we, we don't know. In the 2022 guideline, is there any change in the targets of blood pressure in diabetics? Any no, still any, less than 130 over 80. 130 still over less 80. than 130 over 80. And so there, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry, Sanjay? sorry, please go ahead, sir. Please yeah, I just I was just asking what are the other changes specific to diabetes with hypertension? Well, Sundar actually touched on it. Um if you're seeing somebody with diabetes and they have either kidney disease, GFR of less than 60, and or heart failure, regardless, HFRF, HFPEF, they need to be on an SGLT2, period. Okay. Now, if you want to use it to control glucose, that's fine, but they need to be on an SGLT2. Now, you want to use metformin, please. Nobody's stopping you. Be my guest. Metformin is still there, but it needs to be married to an SGLT2. And, and Sundar made a good point. Let's say you don't have kidney disease. Let's say you don't have uh, heart failure, but you've had an MI. Guess what? You need to be married to a GLP-1 RA with the metformin. Any Sundar. changes in the other drugs like um, like the ARBs being the, I mean, the other drugs which are specifically indicated in diabetes with hypertension? No, no, come on. That's mom and apple pie. Uh, the 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 uh, ARBs are, it's a given that you're going to be on an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. Right? That that's if we're having a discussion about that, we have big problems. Okay. That you have to be on for sure for blood pressure. Period. Now, for additional blood pressure medicines, the first question, very important question: Did you measure the urine for albumin? Yeah. If you didn't, I'll see you in court for malpractice. It's very, very important that you measure albumin. Otherwise, you really don't know what the level of kidney function is. Yeah. 
If you have large amounts of albuminuria, then ARB has to be on board, SGLT2 has to be on board, um, non-dehydropyridine diltiazem can be on board as an additive of benefit. All of those things help in slowing kidney disease progression in the diabetic. I think Sundari also said this point about albuminuria being one of the very important factors. Sundar, you, you also highlighted this, Sundar. Yes, you and I have... Uh, yeah, about but albuminuria. albuminuria, I know I have... Uh, you highlighted You know, clarified this with Dr. Barclays. is a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than it is. But the biggest uh, uh, hooker there is, there are people with normal albuminuric kidney failure. They yeah. go down to zero, no protein in the urine. So that, you know, that... You, you, yeah, that's a great, great entity, Bakrish. We'd like to say something about that non-albuminic. Uh... Sundar is absolutely right. And it accounts, it's estimated, it accounts for about 10% of all people with diabetes uh, having so-called non-albuminuric kidney failure. Nobody has a clue. That's the number one question Vivian Fonseca asks me. Well, what's the mechanism? Well, if I knew that, uh, you know, I'd be in science. I, I don't think anybody knows why. Uh, it's postulated that it's interstitial disease and somehow the, the uh, glomerulus gets away with it. That makes zero sense. So I don't understand. Sundar maybe has a, a hypothesis for this. I, I really don't know. And to my knowledge, I've asked, nobody else seems to know. Yeah. My hypothesis is, and just for the record, uh, I had the privilege of debating Dr. Barclays at American Heart, if you remember, in 2019. He said SGLT2 inhibitors are hemodynamic. And I said, it is the fuel hypothesis. And I we was really learn. nervous. <laughs> we all learn. I do remember. We all learn. We learn, we live, and we keep learning over there. But to me, so I always tell people, and this goes back to my the person who taught me nephrology in Madras, uh, um, I'm blanking on his name. I can't believe. Uh, huh. He's in Apollo. He was an Apollo doctor. 30 seconds. Money. Dr. Money. MK Money. MK Money. Thank you. Thank you for that. He stimulated this interest in me in the 1980s uh, over there. The, everybody says the kidney is a filter. I said there are two organs in one. There is the filter and there is the pump. And I tell people the filter, the glomerulus, it does not have much of an energy consumption because the energy for it is the heart, which has pumped the blood and it just goes through. The tubule has to do all the thing, 80%, and Dr. Bakras can cut this thing, of the energy consumed is that KATPS pump, which it is using. Now, whether it takes it back in the PCT, the loop of Enli, wherever it is, it has to do it. And the other point, so my point is, the glomerulus is okay. I mean, hyperglycemia can damage it. And then the protein leaks through, protein is toxic to the interstitium and all that. You get the fibrosis, you get a lot of things. And then the hypertension also, there's a, you know, is it increase in glomerular pressure, which is forcing its way through. But I believe, you know, these people who are, now it is my speculation, there is tubular hypoxia taking place because diabetes to me is also tissue hypoxia at the level. And in the inner middle of the kidney, and Dr. Barclays, correct me if I'm wrong, the PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen is about 10, 15, 20. It cannot support oxidative phosphorylation. So the fuel there has to be purely glucose in the glycolytic thing. You cannot use anything else. And the beauty also is the guy who's doing most of the work, the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, Glucose is not a preferred fuel. Their ketone is also not a preferred fuel over there. They use fatty acids because it's a big thing over there. And the reason we, we don't know yet why glucose is not preferred is those cells are the ones which do your gluconeogenesis. They're the ones sitting over there. So nature doesn't want a futile cycle. You make it and you use it. That kind of doesn't make sense. So the fuel thing is different all through it. And my thing is that with SGLT2 inhibitors, ketones become a fuel. I don't know if it is right or wrong. So wait, so Sindir, I, I agree with everything you said, and I want to add one thing to you. The kidney is not two things. The kidney is three things. It oh, is okay. also an endocrine organ, because yes. let's not forget about renin. 
Let's not forget. I mean, let's just you know, erythropoietin. 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 And, and okay, the fascinating I mean, thing is th that's fine. In fetal life, sorry. Yeah. In fetal life, the liver makes erythropoietin. The moment yeah. you are born, within a week or two, the kidney. And this fascinated me. I've gone back and looked at all the original literature about why is the kidney sensing hypoxia? We have all the carotid body, this and that. They are not sensing hypoxia. The paracortical See, cells, and I'd be interested in your thoughts. I have my own thoughts. No, no, no. I, I agree 100%. And you brought up something that unfortunately can only be looked at at a basic science level. And that's why clinically, you know, one could argue that SGLT2s are protecting the kidney in a mechanism that is not too different than is protecting the heart in terms of metabolic pathways in the hypoxic state it has not been examined. So yeah, it's not been examined. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happens, this is my thing. So, you know, we all check, you know, the finger ox, it's 98, 96, 92, we're okay. But from 90 to 98 is an 8% drop. That's, you might say, hey, it's nothing. But in the kidney, if it drops from in the medulla, if we, it is dropping from say 20 to 12, that is a huge, that's a 50, almost 50% drop. So it is uniquely poised to pick up small, clinically relevant things. And those, you know, it is at the paracortical junction of those, uh, they are actually neuroendocrine cells which are there, which make the erythropoietin. When they are hypoxic and they don't, they become fibroblasts. They de-differentiate as it were. And the, all the SGLT2 studies that's been shown, erythropoietin goes up, hematocrit goes up, they rejuvenate them. The Japanese have done a lot of uh, work on that, uh, looking at the re-differentiation of those cells. Dr. Bakris, I just my thoughts. Regarding, is there any other um, tubular dysfunction beyond uh, what Sundar described in diabetics? Tubular dysfunction. Well, yeah, you can develop renal tubular acidosis uh, which is common. Usually it's longer term. And again, I think Sundar said something and I'm going to come back to it. The workhorse of the kidney, everybody thinks the workhorse is the glomerulus. The workhorse of the kidney is a proximal tubule. And the amount of energy that is needed, the reabsorption that is occurring, the, the homeostasis that's responsible for is just out of control. Now, yes, Long-term, the distal tubule, you can develop renal tubular acidosis there because so, so basically hydrogen and, and potassium are not going to be in sync. But guess what? That can happen at the proximal tubule as well. So uh, there, are, there are a number of things that can... It's amazing to me that the focus is on glomerular diseases when in fact the tubule can have all kinds of things go wrong with it. And it, it, most of the time it doesn't. So... It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. The second question yeah. is what Sanjay had asked you. Isha, just one minute, Anjali. The second question to ask you is that Sanjay asked me about the dippers and non-dippers. And we know the non-dippers in diabetic have, uh, have some sort of a uh, subclinical hypertension, whatever you call it. And they're also prone to kidney damage because of diabetes, uh, almost equal to people who are hypertension. And... Uh, of course, you have given the, is there any specific mention about managing them in the new guideline? There is nothing in the new guidelines about that because that is not well understood. I can tell you, I just finished writing an editorial. It's not published yet. It's going to be published next month in hypertension on the longitudinal trajectory of blood pressure. And so if we look at this mathematically and we look at the total area under the curve, of blood pressure, not what is it in the office, what is it at home, the total area under the curve. The kidney not only modulates blood pressure, but it's a good buffer of blood pressure to protect itself within a certain range. But if you reset everything at a higher level, that protection erodes with time. So if you have diabetes, and now on top of that, you got a blood pressure, not real high, but let's say 150, all right? The kidney will protect itself to a certain extent, but if you start getting spikes through the day and they become more frequent and the pressure is up at night, the kidney loses this ability to protect itself and you will get faster declines in kidney function. And one of the things that predicts this, believe it or not, is quality of sleep. Absolutely. Quality of sleep. 
I'm not talking about sleep apnea. That's that's a given. But I'm talking about people that have anxiety. They can't get to sleep. Or they get to sleep, but they stay asleep for two hours. Then they're up. Then they can't get back to sleep. Those people are disasters in terms of blood pressure, in terms of speed of kidney function decline, in terms of glucose control across the board. And until you fix that, and you can't fix it with just giving blood pressure medicine or glucose, you got to fix the sleep, then you're okay. Fantastic answer. Anjali, you had some question? Yes, sir. So this is related to Dr. Murliya sir's uh, talk on uh, ancient to current management of diabetes. And I, I really, uh, uh, it's, it was passionate, spontaneous, I don't have words. But I want you to help me to know whether I have understood correctly, sir. From ancient times to now, what I think, especially when you mentioned that the SGLT2 inhibitors have taught us diabetes like nothing else has uh, taught us. And I think these two separate because uh, the treatments that were done, especially of the ketogenic uh, treatments that were done with the nutritional and the metabolic uh, parameters, changing uh, herbs and all that. So here there are, aren't there two distinct differences? One where people are born with a carbohydrate metabolism problem, like type 1s and people with autoimmune disorders, uh, uh, autoimmune Dis the defects in the carbohydrate metabolism pathway, insulin, glucagon, and all that. And then we have certain who are born with a tendency but are dealing with a fuel and a fluid overload, isn't it? I mean, that uh, we are only talking about fuel calories, I understand, but I think haven't SGLT taught us that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors taught us that there is also an overload of fluid that we have to deal with. And, and because we are removing the fluid and it's giving such an important results in improvement of kidney function, heart function, apart from hyperglycemia management. I mean, it's a very complex, complex question. Uh, let me do it. But I just, if I may make a point to the renal tubular acidosis, there are very few patients. I had when I've had some patients for a long time. It's type 4 RTA. And these are the patients you we, people will say they're on Lasix or something and they're on fluttercortisone for the, uh, you know, the hyperkalemia and all that. So I've had a pain. People will say, what are you doing? You're using fluttercortisone, you're retaining sodium, and then you're giving Lasix. But that's the only thing that kept them going. So, and it is the hyporenin, hypoaldo. And for my, the fellows in endocrinology, I always say, what is the hyperenin, hyperaldo, Barter syndrome? And doctor, <laughs> this thing. So there are two uh, separate things over there. But coming back to your question, see, this has fascinated me as well. And uh, if you've listened to Dr. DeFranzo, uh, he's a nephrologist and an endocrinologist. And he said, this is what he said in one talk. When the big guy in the sky put the kidney in, he told, you have two jobs, right? You need to keep the salt in, because if you don't keep the salt in, you don't have blood flow, you can't live. You don't have a vascular compartment. But then when you have the flow, you need nutrition. So he said, sugar. And the transporter in the gut and in the kidney is the sodium glucose. But the body prefers sodium. That is the active transport. Glucose just sits on its back and gets in over there because you can use fat for energy. You can use, except, uh, and then there's a very complex procedure to convert protein into carbohydrate. You cannot convert, in humans, you cannot convert fat back to glucose. Glucose can become fat, but we don't have the machinery to put it in there. So, so the nature, and actually this goes back to Dr. Bakris says, when we came out of the ocean, we were living in a water environment. That is why it doesn't make sense that we are you know, trying to salt when we lived in that environment. And now we have to protect to keep. So sodium glucose are both there. They are both running together. So I take your point that you know, it is salt. But I do not believe, I mean, type 1 is a different disease that is purely uh, over there. But in type 2s, now you could have the metabolic syndrome, but the genetic component is very small. It is the environmental thing which we do to ourselves. And the body has got, Dr. Barclays can bear your tremendous uh, reserves to adjust. You can eat 10 packets of chips a day. If your kidneys are good, it'll get out. You can eat tw drink 20 cups of water a day. All you're going to do is key. The body knows how to. That's the beauty of the inner medulla where the that's why the oxygen is low because there is no blood flow there. Otherwise, you wash out that gradient to take back all the sodium. 
So I don't know that I've answered your question, but salt and sugar go together. Salt is more important than the sugar to the body. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Marcus can add his thoughts. No, you're, I, I was listening. And I, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking that one of the things I tell the patients is the kidney, you know, God knew that we were going to be stupid and we would abuse ourselves. <laughs> and so the amount, think of the kidney as workers on an assembly line. And so the work comes, all the nutrition, the salt, the glucose, it all comes and they're handling it and all it's fine, okay? But now you've increased the assembly line, the same number of workers, but now you've got five times the work. Most of the time in the factory, those people would quit. Here, the kidney does it. And ultimately, some people are going to die off because they can't take it. But there's endurance built in to our bodies. And that's why we're doing so well. But the one other thing that Sundar knows, didn't say this because he was focused on the kidney. One of the things I also tell the house staff is that the heart and the kidney are a married couple. And they actually talk to each other. They've got hormones, they've got nerves. They, there's all ways to talk to each other. If one isn't doing well, the other one is going to try to help, but it's not going to do well either. And it's going to try. And ultimately, if one starts failing, the other one's going to fail. And you can do this, what you can to support it, and it, it will support it. But the, the thing that people don't appreciate is beyond that, the, the, I, I will tell you, I was at a meeting. This was a large clinical trial meeting. 700 people are from all over the world. And I got up and I said this. I was followed by a cardiologist who echoed it. And then Peter Rossing got up. Now, Peter Rossing is an endocrinologist from the Steno in Denmark. And Peter and I are good friends. We were all good friends. And Peter goes, well, George, if that married couple is there, they're living in my house, the endocrine environment. <laughs> and it's actually very nicely put, very nicely put. Because guess what? The gut the gut in kidney failure, and not dialysis, but reduced kidney function, the gut reduces the amount of branch chain amino acids it puts out the bacteria. Guess what? The heart needs those branch chain amino acids for energy. So all of a sudden, you've got an energy deficit. So this is integrated physiology at its best. And it's really complex. And I, I just wanted to put that out there to say that, yeah, we can talk about the tubule, we can talk about the macula densa, but by the way, <laughs> there's a whole environment. Uh, you're talking about a part of one room in your house, but the, the rest of the house is there. So. Good. So, so Sundar, I have a question, question for you. Sanjay. Uh, uh, you've, you've now seen the benefits from DAPA CKD and, uh, you know, credence and all this, where You've seen, you know, they've included patients all the way up to GFR of 25. And, uh, you know, uh, there are reports about using metformin even in low GFR patients, and it really doesn't cause too much of problems and anecdotal lactic acidosis. Do you think, I mean, that's a gray area that I'm treading into, and I don't know what your thoughts would be. But, Let me uh, tell you. Yeah. Me, now, wait a minute. All right, ask your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> ask your question. So do you think we, ahead, need to, we need to revise the guidelines to see that we should stop saying that, you know, we should stop using SGT to below 45 and we should uh, stop using metformin again below, you know, six, uh, 45 again. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about this? Should our guidelines so, be revised? So SGLT2s, so the 2022 guidelines, SGLT2s can be used down to 22, uh, 25, 25. Okay. Now you may not know this, because I'm not sure it's actually online yet, but it will be eminently. There is a paper out of Canada. <clears throat> it's a small study, 250 patients, something like that, looking at sodigaflozin in stage four CKD, stage four. And what they found was it was perfectly safe to be used <clears throat> down to a GFR of 15, 15. And there is a study going on right now in England in dialysis patients with SGLT2s, specifically looking at the heart, obviously. But the, the 2022 20, uh, guidelines will say SGLT2 is down to 25. Now, metformin, with all due respect, is freaking poison if you're using it to GFRs down below 30. No way. 
And it's unappreciated the amount of lactic acidosis that occurs in patients that are not that compliant when you're between GFRs of 30 and 45. It's not as not that bad, but it's there. So for me, I automatically cut the dose, and this is the recommendation. When you get to 45, you automatically cut the dose to 500 BID. And I got to tell you, for me, when you get to 30, 35, I stop it, and I move to other things. And I'm a big fan, since Sundar mentioned Ralph, I'm a big fan of pioglitazone. And I use it at seven and a half milligrams. I may go to 15. I don't go any higher. But I've had amazing results with that. So, and there is a stroke benefit, as you know, from the, from the data. So, you know, that's my two cents as a nephrologist. Thank you. I think Sanjay, this time, and uh, it's my, Sanjay, we, we can, can I make one point? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. No, no. I agree exactly. Uh, 45, 30 to 45 and below 30 in the US, of course, you know, like he said, I'll see you in court. So you're running on things. But we didn't touch on one aspect of the kidney. Now, lactate is not the problem, but it is secreted as lactic acid. The H ion and the kidney does your acid base. You can, I mean, you can do a little bit with the respiration, but the kidney has to do the metabolic part of that. You can't deal with that acid load if you have a bad kidney. Lactate is a good fuel. You can do lactic dehydrogenase and take it back to pyruvate and do it. But the H ion is the problem over there. Dr. Isha, you want to ask something before we close up? Isha? Please. Yeah, that's it, sir. I don't know. What else okay. to say? Yeah. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much, Sundar. And thank you, Sundar, for stepping in for George. Yes. <laughs> At the last thank minute. you. Thank you. <laughs> but the last time your... I stepped in for Dr. DeFranzo, if you remember, in yes. Pune. I, I, that's true. That's, <laughs> that's true. That's becoming yeah, a habit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but good Dr. Bakris came back, Sanjay. And yes. thank you so much, George. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Lost to it. We did discuss the diabetes guideline 2022. I mean, that was your subject for the second talk. Thank you, Bakrish. And, and, and thank you. The, thank you thank very you. much. It was an excellent session. And I would like to close the session and thank Dr. Das, Dr. Dr. Isha, of course, Dr. Sudhar, and Dr. Bakris. Need not be thanked. Both. I mean, they, the, uh, we should thank more than the, anything else because they spare time and come and raise this platform to give such excellent lectures. So thank you, both of you. And uh, we look forward to have you physically next year in Pune. Okay. Face to face. Face thank to you. And, thank you, everyone. From the scientific you. committee, we close the session today. You want to say something? And, and we would like, like to remind everybody we will start at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. No, 8, so, 8.40 in the morning. Sorry, tomorrow. 8.40. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, bye -bye. bye -bye, everyone. Bye. Join Thank in you. tomorrow by 8.40. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity, Sanjay. Thank you very much. Me and Isha, thank you profusely. Thank, Thank you, so you sir. Thank you, Thank Anjali. You. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So I'm leaving the meeting. Bye. Isha, bye. Good to meet you.